Well, welcome everyone today to this uh, discussion about using strategic litigation to tackle modern slavery. My name is Nick Grono and I'm the CEO of the Freedom Fund and the moderator of today's discussion. And I'm delighted to be joined by three leading practitioners on this issue. We have uh, Martina Vandenberg, President of the Human Trafficking Legal Centre based in DC. Uh, we have Sandra Kossar, Director of Sherpa based in Paris. And we have Achana Katecha, founder and CEO of the Re Remedy Project based in Hong Kong. So the threshold question for today's uh, discussion is, well, why focus on strategic litigation? The answer for us as an anti-slavery organization is straightforward. The fact is that many companies operating around the world today have a high risk of forced labor in their operations and supply chains, but they are often able to operate with impunity because more often than not, the exploitation happens far away in countries with minimal protections for workers and with little or no enforcement. So to deliver a systemic change to eradicate modern slavery from the global economy, we need to change the rules of the game. We need to ensure that companies are no longer able to treat slavery in their operations as simply a byproduct of doing business. Strategic litigation is a powerful tool to compel businesses to change their practices and to take action to address modern slavery. Companies will act if their bottom line is threatened. Litigation can therefore act as a deterrent by increasing the costs, both financial and reputational, to those who profit from slavery. However, while there's been an increase in the use of litigations to hold companies accountable for broader human rights and environmental abuses, it remains underused in the anti-slavery space. Anti-slavery strategic litigation is being pioneered by a small group of dedicated lawyers and activists committed to advancing corporate accountability, and many of them are on this call today. Uh, most of this work is transnational. It's pursued through cases filed in the US and Europe on behalf of workers in the global south who have been impacted by the actions of multinational corporate defendants. There have been some high profile cases in recent years that are building pressure on companies to proactively take measures to prevent human rights impacts. For example, last year, the Canadian Supreme Court in Nevson case held that Canadian companies could be liable for violations of customary international law, including forced labor in their overseas operations. But we need many more such cases to make a real dent in the business of slavery. And at the Freedom Fund, our legal strategies initiative has been supporting strategic litigation for the past four years. Our aim is to push forward and expand the field of modern slavery litigation with a focus on corporate accountability using a combination of civil, criminal and trade law mechanisms. So to learn what that might mean in practice, we're now gonna to turn to our panelists. Martina, can I ask you first, what you see as the unique value of strategic litigation and its role in the wider effort to, tra to end trafficking and slavery? So strategic litigation introduces something that has long been missing and that's risk. Corporations will not change unless they face risk of accountability. And so the impunity that you talked about, Nick, is just absolutely ubiquitous. I'm reminded of the times before, before enforcement of anti-bribery statutes, when literally bribes were tax deductible by corporations. Once the world started enforcing the law against bribery, that changed and now corporations take bribery seriously. We want corporations to take human trafficking, modern slavery, forced labor, just as seriously as they take bribery. And with strategic litigation, they're beginning to. Governments have failed to bring these cases. And so now non-governmental organizations, and as you say, pioneering lawyers and trafficking survivors themselves are bringing cases in the United States, invoking extraterritorial jurisdiction. So let me just give you three quick examples. One case is a case that was brought by Cambodian workers who alleged that they were trafficked into seafood processing plants in Thailand. That case is pending in the United States. A second case is case involving children from Mali who alleged that they were trafficked into forced labor by Nestle and Cargill. That case is pending before the Supreme Court of the United States. And then closer to home, literally ripped from the headlines, a case in the New York Times just last week of workers from India brought to the United States and allegedly forced to build temples for less than a dollar an hour. Again, these cases, none of them have been prosecuted. And so strategic litigation fills this enormous accountability gap. So far, there have been 458 cases brought in the US federal courts, and those have resulted in $255 million 
in damages awards and settlements. And those are just the ones that we know of. Those don't count the confidential settlements. So we feel like strategic litigation has enormous potential and really we're just getting started. Well, thanks, Martina. It's encouraging to hear at least we're getting started, but obviously there's a long way to go. Um, Sandra, how is it in Europe? I mean, I know Sherpa is a very active um, actor in strategic litigation in Europe. What are you seeing? And uh, yeah, what are you seeing? And what do you think of the key developments recently? Well, we do indeed see that strategy litigation has a crucial value and play a major role in the wider effort to end trafficking and slavery. And the way we use it um, is first, obviously, to allow remedy for victim, but uh, more broadly to generate impact beyond the litigation itself and individual dual victims. So when using strategic litigation, we are seek seeking systemic change, as you mentioned before. And indeed, strategic mitigation can influence case law and legal framework, as it has in our um, uh, example. Uh, it has allowed us to denounce some legislation and also help us expose the inadequacy of the corporate accountability legal framework. But more broadly, it promotes a political and legal evolution by obtaining a new interpretation of the law, which can benefit a much la larger group of people. So if I was to sum it up, um, the way we present it, Chap, I say, we say that strategy litigation is an opportunity to bring cases to court and to see in practical terms, what are the gaps in the legal framework and obstacles encountered. And then these cases feed advocacy, which in turn aim to change the legal framework and mobilize around corporate accountability. So how we've used it at Sherpa, um, we have three cases that I can mention very briefly. One is against Ocean uh, for its potential involvement in the Rana Plaza. You remember maybe this building that collapsed in Bangladesh in 2013. And I think the importance of this case is that um, it helped illustrate and demonstrate the need for legislation that hold multinational accountable. And it led us to the adoption of the law on the duty of vigilance in 2017. The second case is against Binchi for forced labor in Qatar. Um, and the media coverage uh, around this case um, has led the company to slightly improve the working condition of workers in Qatar, uh, working on the soccer, uh, World Soccer Cup um, uh, infrastructure. Um, this case could uh, encourage an ambitious European directive on mandatory due diligence. And briefly, the last case um, that we file uh, um, in April last month uh, is um, against four multinational in the garment industry involving the Uyghur community in China. Um, and we um, uh, have filed the, the cases on crimes of aggravated bondage, crime of human trafficking in organized gang and crime of genocide and crimes against humanity. And we consider that while journalists and researchers have highlighted the existence of systemized forced labor in this um, region, those companies, as well as many other transnational, obviously, but continue to subcontract part of their production um, produced in this area, thus knowingly taking advantage in their value chains of the workforce in a region where crimes against humanity are being perpetrated. Well, thanks, Sandra. Some big and ambitious uh, cases underway there. Achana, you've been using legal approaches to tackle modern slavery in Southeast Asia for many years. How does strategic litigation fit into this work? And to what extent do groups based in a region see strategic litigation as a way to secure accountability for modern slavery? I mean, Nick, in the context of corporate legal accountability, the use of strategic litigation in Southeast Asia is fairly scarce and patchy at best. And there are a number of reasons for this that are really important to understand and explore. Firstly, local groups oper often operate under the use of threats, intimidation, reprisals, real pressure from corporate actors in order to drop cases. The use, the prolific use of criminal defamation lawsuits is also uh, one of the reasons why not many of these actions will see the light of day. There is a really strong perception on the part of local groups, lawyers and NGOs that the pressures and needs to deliver time and resource efficient solutions for beneficiary groups is often at odds with the long term play, the, the sort of resources that are involved in running um, a strategic litigation matter. 
And when it comes to transnational cases, seeking corporate accountability across supply chains is often hampered by, by a number of issues. Some of these are difficulties on the ground with identification, identification of fact patterns, uh, difficulty with identifying correct jurisdictions to approach in order to, to bring a case, um, how to evolve um, a course of action, how to do supply chain due diligence and investigations in order to even ascertain what the parameters of building a course of action will be. Um, in many of the jurisdictions, there are extremely strong rules around procedural rules around um, litigation funding. So this is prohibited, which also is, is a real issue. Um, however, you know, I'd, I'd like to, to say that the recent CBP action in, in Malaysia and um, the uh, sort of, you know, triumphs that we've seen in the environmental and community rights movements suggests that there are lessons that can be learned by uh, the modern slavery movement in particular can I, the can I, sugar can i just interrupt the cbp was that the top gloves case the um imports of gloves into the us that's right yes right. also you know in the environmental and and uh, community rights movement the metropole sugar case the investigation by the philippines human rights commission into the 4647 oil companies all of those uh, you know have present lessons that can be learned and transferred across because we are seeing very little um collaborative work or crossover action between these two movements and there's definitely much more that can be leveraged and following the cbp um action in malaysia for example it was very interesting to see local groups and local ngos get really enthused about you know doing a lot more in this space. So I think the interest is peaking. It's a question of finding the opportunities and leveraging on these in order to do more. Great, thanks Achana, that's really helpful. So that's a quick run through of some of the kind of current developments, what's going on right now, but why don't we look forward and talk a little bit more about the opportunities uh, and where we can uh, invest resources and efforts to um, drive a greater focus on strategic litigation. Um, certainly at the Freedom Fund, we believe there's lots of potential, but I'd be interested from hearing from each of you whether you share that view. Um, starting with you again, Martina, you've been at the forefront of strategic litigation uh, in the US. And recently, um, you've been actively supporting efforts to use the US Tariff Act to address forced labour and supply chains. Um, perhaps um, you could talk th us through, you know, what are the opportunities and what the future holds for strategic litigation against corporations in the US? and you know, how you see the various uh, corporate, account uh, uh, corporate accountability mechanisms uh, factoring into that. So strategic litigation in the federal courts is booming from my perspective. You know, when we did the initial strategic litigation meeting in London years ago, we struggled to find lawyers who were handling these cases. We just had our most recent strategic litigation meeting in Washington, D.C. virtually, of course, and we had close to 40 lawyers at the meeting, people who were actively engaged in this work. So I think the bench is now much broader, the lawyers are much more sophisticated and the case law has been built. So there's tremendous opportunity in the federal courts, but beyond that, the Tariff Act, which really only became a viable tool in 2016 with, when the law was amended, is now being used by advocates to prevent the importation of goods made with forced labor from entering the US market. And that Tariff Act prohibition on the importation of forced labor made goods is spreading across the globe. We're hoping to have a sort of global Tariff Act, if you will, so that there can be no safe harbor for goods made with forced labor. Already we're seeing Canada adopting a Tariff Act-like law. Mexico is doing the same. There are conversations in Australia. And the, the power of the Tariff Act, again, in, in sort of collaboration with the with the with the strategic litigation in the federal courts but the power of the tariff act is that it is quick and there are very low barriers to entry so anyone including non-governmental organizations including trafficking survivors including you know advocates anyone can put a petition into customs and border protection of the u.s government and then Customs and Border Protection can issue what's called a withhold release order to ban the importation of those goods from entering the market. It is remarkable to see the response that corporations have given to this law because it has hit them 
at the bottom line, not two years after the litigation starts, not three years, not 15 years after the litigation starts, sometimes just months after a petition is filed. And most recently, the US government has not only banned the entry of rubber gloves from Malaysia, they have also seized two enormous shipments of rubber gloves from Malaysia, brought in by Top Glove in violation of the import prohibition. The first set of gloves seized, they were worth $518,000. The second shipments of gloves seized were worth $690,000. Again, these are really significant numbers. In addition, the US government is now beginning to enforce fines. So one company that brought in stevia, an artificial sweetener from China, was fined $575,000 by the US government for bringing those goods into the United States in violation of the import ban. So we have tremendous optimism, again, that as Archana said, petitioners around the globe are interested in filing petitions to block goods from entering these markets, but also that the Tariff Act uh, concept is spreading. We've even seen a petition filed uh, in the United Kingdom uh, using an ancient law that's a little bit like the Tariff Act that prohibits importation of goods made with prison labor. So the Tariff Act also has enormous potential for us. Yeah, I'm always um, impatient for progress, but it's a nice reminder of just how far things have come in the last five years. I remember that convening and how we were scrambling to find lawyers who were sufficiently engaged and interested. Um, and it's also exciting to hear, you know, the prospects looking forward. So, um, okay, well, let's move again from um, from the US to Europe. And um, we don't have a tariff act in Europe, but there is certainly a lot of interest, Sandra, around the introduction of mandatory human rights due diligence legislation and the potential for that to be a game changer for corporate accountability. Um, do you see that as, as having potential for litigation in coming years? Well, I think a European legislation on mandatory human rights due diligence could be a um, useful tool um, for strategy litigation, obviously, but provided is response to victims' need. And at the moment, the discussion essentially takes place from the perspective of companies and under the so-called Sustainable Corporate Governance Initiative. Hence, the current focus on due diligence, processes, governance, guidelines, and for us, obviously, corporate impunity is not due to a lack of processes or guidelines. It's due to lack of accountability or liability. Um, so for an effective European duty of vigilance, we need first to go beyond the French law. So meaning reverse the burden of proof, which still rests on the claimants. Whereas companies are better placed to establish why the risk in question could not have been foreseen or why they could not have prevented the damage from occurring in their value chain. So that's need to be done. The second thing is also to extend the scope of application with regard to the company concern. And companies need to see duty of vigilance as more than a mere obligation to put processes in place and as an obligation to force companies to adopt and effectively implement all measures necessary to identify risk. We would also need to strengthen existing liability regime and provide for criminal liability as a legal person. So I would not really call the future legislation a game changer as major hurdles to successful litigation would still remain. And we've mentioned that, that also in the first uh, question is extraterritorial jurisdiction. The liability regime also don't take into account the reality of corporation operation as they don't challenge the corporate veil and also the unequal balance between association or NGOs and economic actors. And I'm not uh, there uh, only speaking about the financial imbalance, but also the fact that in the fabric itself of the norms, um, it has been influenced by corporation and the so-called corporate capture. Uh, even today, we're speaking about due diligence, you know, or self-regulation, non-financial performance, best practices, CSR. Um, so these all uh, imbalance need to be uh, taken into consideration if we want uh, an appropriate legislation and also the imbalance of access to evidence. And there are too many issues that I think we should pay attention to is the standing or admissibility of association. Um, 
there has been a restrictive movement in recent years, both in legislation and in case law, and it's really a, a, an issue of uncertainty for NGOs. And it is, it is a case uh, for Sherpa in the Lafarge and the Samsung case. And the, the second thing we need to take uh, um, also to pay attention with is the slack, you know, strategy litigation against public participation or judicial policy of intimidation, because uh, there is an increasing attempt to silence voices to speak out against corporate activities, uh, not only against human rights defenders or NGOs, but journalists, whistleblower, and on a, on a variety of legal grounds. And these practices harm the general interest by preventing democratic debate and by clogging up the court and harm to individual and association who find themselves financially cornered, you know, and deprived of freedom of expression. And it has impacted Sherpa also uh, and some of our, uh, you know, um, communities that we defend. And in Vinci, the case I mentioned earlier, I mean, Vinci has used, uh, you know, slap uh, six times against Sherpa for one case that we brought against them. The, so I do see potential for litigation encouraging improvement of workers' rights and situation, um, but it needs to be uh, really uh, worked on and maybe also dig into the, the audit sector. So, so I'm hearing that there is potential for um, progress, but uh, activists and NGOs and others need to be very closely engaged to, um, to ensure we have a, an appropriate due diligence regime. Um, and in the meantime, pay attention to actions to punish NGOs for bringing cases, which is not mm -hmm. just uh, restricted to France and, and Europe, but happens elsewhere. I know this means appalling cases in Thailand and, and I assume happens um, all over the place. So um, Achana, Currently, um, anti-slavery strategic litigation is concentrated in the US and Europe, where multinational corporations are generally headquartered. Um, but do you see opportunities to expand this work to other jurisdictions? And if so, what's needed to create a more global movement? Sure, Nick. I mean, you know, there is certainly an opportunity to expand the work and in particular to support the origination of a much stronger pipeline of case referrals from Southeast Asia you know, to, to Europe um, or to the United States, or even within the Southeast Asian region itself. The Metropole Sugar case is an example of um, a case bought, brought by aggrieved Cambodians in Thailand, and Thailand was the right choice of um, a forum for that particular case. Um, the case that, that Martina mentioned um, in the opening question is also an example of, you know, transnational a case being brought across and through a pipeline that is currently actually pretty inactive, um, to say the least. There are a few things that can be done, and I think it's important to consider these given that um, there is a lot of optimism and positive um, progress that is being made in the US, which you know we also feel in, in Southeast Asia that we should ride the wave while the wave is there to be ridden. And, and some of these are, for example, you know, building the capacity of local NGOs and lawyers to actually understand supply chain relationships, the principles and methodologies of conducting supply chain investigations and research as well. This would include, for example, understanding and engaging with the landscape of local and international actors um, who could assist potentially with developing in-depth supply chain investigations. Domestically, you know, there, there is a, a real need to focus capacity building on the origination of causes of action and to really look at a much broader uh, picture. So, for example, a picture that not simply focuses on anti-trafficking or forced labor related actions, but also um, at crimes under contract law, under tort law, consumer laws, trade laws um, and regulations, and potentially public disclosures for listed companies as well. Um, another thing that could really help and, and would be um, really good to explore in the region would be working on creating and maintaining relationships with global North NGOs who are very much well versed in, in doing this work, um, very much like the Human Trafficking Legal Center and Sherpa as well, and working towards building a network uh, of um, uh, sort of, you know, useful contact points, but also referral pathways. Um, involving local and international NGOs, lawyers, academics, worker representatives, uh, forensic accountants, investigators, etc. This, of course, requires funding. And very often, funding is not available until at a much later stage in the process. And this really hampers efforts on the ground because, you know, really to do the investigation is expensive and to anything that is pre-action is, is fairly um, expensive as well. 
So developing you know, a global movement will require this degree of collaboration, the networking, but also um, we'll need to be very mindful of local customs and, and the equality of the relationships as well. Something that came up in a recent uh, study that we did commissioned by the Freedom Fund was very much that um, local NGOs felt that there was an unequal and uneven relationship uh, between Global North NGOs and NGOs from Southeast Asia, where they felt that they were just a source of information. So that building of trust is really important and also an understanding of the security risks that are run by human rights defenders and lawyers on the ground in Southeast Asia. And finally, I think, you know, to help manage some of these sort of, you know, opportunities crystallize really, it's important that the embedding of the benefits of um, integrating transnational action outcomes into local domestic uh, frameworks does happen so that people you know in a faraway land can see the benefit of, of having these actions taken uh, in another jurisdiction yeah i can't agree more um, <laughs> um, we absolutely have to ensure that the benefits are are, um, are received and felt uh, where those are suffering the most exploitation and that's the whole purpose of this um, thanks, Achana, uh, for that great um, overview. Well, thanks to all our three panelists who really are, with their organisations, leaders in the field of strategic litigation for that comprehensive overview. Um, and I hope you um, all are as excited as we are about the opportunity for strategic litigation to drive real change. Certainly at the Freedom Fund, we're committed to supporting strategic litigation as an important part of the fight against modern slavery. Um, we think that um, you know, investments in the strategic litigation space have had an outsized impact um, for the amount of uh, funding that's being committed. But it's also clear that we're only beginning to scratch the surface of what's possible. And it's also clear that litigation is expensive. You can have an outsized impact, but it takes the resources. So uh, certainly at the Freedom Fund, we're going to spend uh, the next few years seeking to mobilize additional resources to diversify and connect the anti-slavery uh, litigation movement uh, and to ensure much greater use of this powerful tool. Uh, so we hope that you'll join us in this journey. We hope that uh, you will also recognize you, you the, uh, the, the um, audience of this webinar will recognize the power and the potential impact of strategic litigation and join us on this journey. Thank you very much.